What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and welcome to another episode of the Backend Engineering Show in a makeshift setup here. This is the poor man's uh, setup. I, I, you don't want to see what I, I made my phone stand on <laughs> to get this shot. But in general, I thought uh, I'll take a few minutes to uh, discuss a, a topic for this show. And that is uh, Postgres version churn and its implication uh, to performance, uh, specifically to I.O. reading effectively. And how does it really affect and how Postgres version 14 addressed this problem of what they called the version churn or version bloat. Right? How about we jump into it and talk about this topic. Welcome to the Back in Engineering Show with your host Hussein Nasser. And the way I'd like to uh, start this topic is to discuss how Postgres uh, versioning or MVCC multi-version concurrency control works and what is the side effect of the design choice that the Postgres team made to create a new version of the row and new tuple effectively to represent the change uh, for that given row. So if you update a row, insert a row, or delete a row, that is effectively a new row being inserted into the database with the change while we keep the state of the old version. Right? While I, I, I absolutely love that design, it has some side effects. And the side effect is, is, is the bloat that uh, uh, results as a result uh, of these operations. As you add, as you update a lot of rows, you will get a lot of stale versions. And those old versions are necessary to be there because older transactions that started before that an update happens needs to see the old state of the row as it existed before okay and it, and the reason it needs to see that state is for consistency right and another thing called isolation right the, this is the i and the c in the asset properties which i talk about in a lot in details in my course another shameless plug here go to database HusseinNasser.com to grab over 18 hours worth of exclusive content there talking about this beautiful bare metal fundamentals. So that's the, that's the decision that the Postgres uh, database made, which is when I update, when I insert, when I delete, go ahead and insert a new tuple. Right. And quick differentiation between what is a tuple and what is a row in Postgres. A row is what the application sees, right? So if I select something, this is a row, let's say primary key seven, that's the unique identifier seven, right? But a tuple is effectively the representation of the physical uh, version of that row at that state, right? So a logical row can uh, have many, many tuples floating around, right? Because it could have been updated many, many times. It could have been deleted effectively, right? And it will it will have multiple tuples, right? So that's that's effectively what it is. But as as a logical representation. The application should only see one of them, right? The more it sees two, that's a corruption. Um, which, by the way, happened to Uber back in 2016, I believe. One of the bugs that they complained about uh, when they moved to MySQL. Um, so that's the decision that the Postgres team made. And, and it's a very elegant decision because now all the transaction can see uh, those uh, all the rows by checking their transaction IDs. So I started this uh, 
at this time right this is the latest committed transaction at that time so i'm only supposed to read rows that are created before this transaction right and this is effectively my visible state right there's many implementation that you could have done uh, dates are one of them but postgres uses the transaction id as a number right and every transaction starts it gets a new id every transaction that changes the data gets a new transaction id and that that's how we we, we basically determine the row of visibility am i supposed to read and see this row that's the question that every transaction asks am i supposed to see that row and every row every tuple has a minimum transaction id and the maximum transaction id and if you are basically between these two if your transaction ID lies between these two then you are supposed to see it if your transaction is after right that means you have uh, you effectively uh, that means that you're not supposed to see this row because well the, the, the existence of a max transaction ID in a row that means it's effectively has been deleted right or has been updated effectively right and, and there is a, a new version of that row so that's how uh, Postgres works with the versioning other databases and uh, quickly we need to mention this right in order to kind of understand how other databases do things uh, MySQL for example they don't do this they do not insert a new row for every change that you make right they don't insert a new tuple but what they do is they keep the heap pages or the physical storage pages represents the latest uh, results effectively right so that when you actually go and read that is the final representation of the row they always only keep the final representation of the row so if you make an update we go and physically make that update to that row on its location effectively now you might say hussein uh, what about older transactions i need to see the older state well the mysql team or i believe oracle is the same thing made the decision that mvc longer running transactions have to do extra work right to determine the older state of the row if they want uh, to see the older state of the row how when you make a change in mysql or other databases all right they make physical change to the row you update a field that update is just overwritten whatever is old is gone in that physical page state right in the in the heap as they call it but before they make that change they record the older state effectively in something called the undo files right so this undo list keeps growing and growing and growing so you'll have a, a list of files a list of some sort of some sort of a data structure that keeps the old state of the row so if an older transaction wants the older version of the row well it, it needs to determine whether it sees, needs to see the latest or not right there is a there is a there is a, a formula for that and once it does it says, oh i need to see that older version it takes the latest version because which is the only thing that is there obviously right and it depends on whether it's a disk or it's a memory cache hopefully someone else read it so it's in the buffer pool so we read that beautiful row but it's not the one i want this is the latest one i'm not supposed to see the latest because i am an old transaction i started way before this transaction changed this row right and committed so it takes that latest row and then start applying the undo file on the row to determine effectively the state of the row and obviously that will slow things down compared to the postgres model where we only it's right there the old row is in the page right 
and uh, I just need to read it. I don't need to do any more work. Okay, so that's the effectively uh, the the different models, and this is very interesting to to understand. And are these the only two ways? No, you, the listener, or the over watching this uh, video, you can make your own uh, model that was never invented. This is what I like to kind of challenge everything that is exists here. And nothing is right and nothing is wrong in, in, in the space of backend engineering, right? Anything can be broken, right? Anything can be challenged. Right? And that, that's a healthy mentality to keep in mind. That's because whatever someone did, it's a human at the end of the day, and they make mistakes. And nothing is perfect. So these, these, this is the data that we have. This is what we have. Right? Will someone invent something better? Definitely. Right? But this is what we have. All right. So these are the decisions that the Postgres team made, which with version. So what is the side effect? of that decision. Updates, physical update to the row. So if I am updating column one, right, I need to create a new row, right? But if I update column two, I have to create a new row. If I update column three, I have to create a new, a new row. So if you shoot three updates same into the same row three times, which is a bad idea, you're gonna get three, three rows, three tuples representing that same row effectively, right? But it's an interesting thing. What if you have an index on column one, an index on column two, and an index on column three? These B3 indexing indexes are separate data structures that exist on disk and pulled in memory if applicable, right, uh, to speed up uh, the read, right? So you have column one index, column two index, column three index. But here's, for Postgres, these B3 indexes effectively contains the column one data or column two data or column three data, but with pointers back to the table, back to the heap, back to the actual you know, the source of truth where everything there, right? So now if you, if you update the row, let's say I updated column one value, right? And this is the row, row seven, whatever it is. When we do an update to column one, we insert a new tuple in, in the heap and says, okay, this is a new version of the row number seven, and let's say it's seven dash, which is the, the new tuple ID, right? It probably has a, a very long number, effectively. It's called tuple ID. Now, those indexes, column one index, column two index, column three index, what will happen? Well, I just changed column one, right, data, because I updated it. I better go to column one index and reshuffle the B tree to include the column one because there is a new value. You need to insert it to the appropriate node, rebalance the B tree as necessary, and now you have a new tree effectively, a brand new tree, right? It, this could be a single page, could, this could be a multiple IO page writing. Who knows? It depends on the state of the tree. Uh, I made a course on on B tree, right? It's an as a as a member only video, and it's also available on my uh, Udemy course if you if you're interested to learn more about B trees in in a fundamental way. So now we have this, right? So that 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 is kind of understandable. We need to update call one, and we also need to in to insert the new tuple ID to point to the row that is latest. Right, the index should not point to the old row anymore. Right? Well, it should. We need to keep the entry in the index where it points to the old row because some other older transaction might need to pull that old version. 
right? And and that SQL statement might have done uh, an index, uh, a plan that is using the index. You can't just update, change, remove the old tuple ID pointer. No, you need to insert a new, right, version of the tuple that points to the new tuple ID. So we have effectively two now, two versions, right? And that looks that is understandable. The problem is, unfortunately, you also need to do the same exact thing for column two index and column three index, despite you never touching the column two or column three. You never touch those values. You updated column one. Yet you need to update the column two index and column three index with the new tuple ID. Question is why? Why do you need to update it? <laughs> well, because new transactions need to read the new row, right? If if a new transaction started after all this mess that we did, and it used column two index, and we haven't updated the tuple ID, it will read the old tuple, right? Because that's what is in uh, that's what it, what is in it. So you need to update those pointers too. Thus, the, this, all this referential integrity becomes very challenging for Postgres to, you know, to ensure correctness. But you can imagine all the, all the bugs that they got through all the years to kind of finally iron out. But that's effectively, you see the problem here, right? Now, any update, you get a new version. And of course, we always have to keep the old version. So if you have n number of indexes, right? then you have to up make n updates effectively. Now, that is not always true, right? Because Postgres had this optimization, it's called a hot, right? Heap only tuple, where it is, it'll be smart enough. If the field that you're effectively, you updated something, column one, column two and column three, it will do an optimization not to update the tuple ID in column two and column three. And the only reason is because it will have some sort of flags. We'll say, okay, let's keep the old tuple, but in the heap, we're gonna add an optimization that tells us, hey, by the way, we're gonna do a pointer of two and a new pointer. Right? The old tuple will point to the new tuple. Right? They do this kind of optimization to effectively do that. However, this, will not be uh, successful if one if you're updating a field in which there is an index on like column one on if you're updating column one and it has an index you have to update column one index period there is no hot optimization that i'm aware of at least right because you have to reshuffle the tree you have to update the actual tree itself right <laughs> but other indexes is the problem so this is where there's not enough time to talk about all this, but it's all logic at the end of the day, if you think about it. Right? This is where fill factor come into the place. You need to, the page on which the heap stores the rows, you need to fill it up until a certain extent so that this heap only tuple can benefit from this optimization. Because the moment the update, the tuple jumps into another page, this is out of the question. But let's take hot optimization out of the questions for now. And let's say that you will end up with a lot of these versions that are effectively bloat. These are effectively just version churn, where column two and column three, which we didn't really touch, we touched column one, yet they are being updated with duplicate versions right so now we we have 10 20 30 40 70 if you if you are in an update heavy workload in postgres be careful because of this if you're updating the same row over and over and over again especially in an automated way yeah, that will kill the performance and because now how power will go the us. We, we don't want to throw words like that. We need to understand what's going on, right? So now 
you will have a lot of tuples pointing to the same row, right? Now, this makes sense if you have older transaction that needs those old rows, but most systems, hopefully, you don't have those long transactions that are running that are just hanging and, and preventing you from removing those old rows, old tuples, to be specific. Because you want to get rid of all this old dead stuff. Definition of dead here is a row that nobody will ever read because all the transactions that started that's supposed to see this old row are dead, are committed, are rolled back. They are none. So this is where Postgres kicks in with a process called vacuum, auto vacuum to be specific. And start cleaning up those stuff. So it's like, all right, we have all this jumble old dead rows. Let's just remove them, right? It will just start to start physically mark them as dead. See, dead, 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 dead. So that Postgres can use this space, that's the first thing, uh, to, to, to insert new rows, right? To insert new index entries, right? Again, we're worried about the index more in this case, right? In this particular situation, right? So Postgres will do this vacuum to clean up this thing. But we didn't really talk about what is the problem if I have a lot of entries that point to the same thing. We're, let's be honest, guys. We're not really worried about desk space, right? In, this, in 2021, we're never worrying about uh, storage that have to be large and stuff like that, right? We're not worrying about that. We are worried about the performance implication of having a lot of rows. What is the problem? When you read the index, how do you read the index? You read it page by page, right? You, read, you issue IO and you get back a bunch of data. This is how the B tree works. You get the internal nodes and you use it to traverse and find the leaf nodes and then you start jumping, 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 right? But these jumps, these are also IOs. A single IO gives you X amount of content. X amount of rows. And the trick here is for your IO to be efficient so that it gives you things that you actually you want. If your IO started giving you thousand duplicate versions that you none of these you actually need, you're gonna start throwing those out and hey, none of this stuff is actually what I need. Let me do another IO. Thousand. All of them are duplicates. Another thousand, all of them are duplicate. And then another IO, you get another thousand. Oh, the last one is actually the one I need. So you did three, four IOs that are useless. So the version churn causes this problem effectively. The more IO slows things down. When things slow down, there is likely you feel it in your uh, queries and your select statements. And um, guys, to be pragma pragmatic, this is rarely the things that slows down applications, right? Let's just be very pragmatic. Postgres, this is, yeah, if you have a des designing an application that is like three, four millisecond latency and you're getting an extra 10, you, you want to shave those extra 10 milliseconds, then you worry about this. Most of the things, based on my 15, 16 years of experience is never the database, you know, tuning when it comes to these low level, you know, efficiency things that the database have to do. It's most of the time is just a bad plan, a bad index, a missing index, or, or too many indexes, stuff like that. It's always us, it's always the back end application, the consumer, not knowing how to, you know, finesse the database. So Postgres 14, this is all comes back to Postgres 14, which is the new version that was released back in September 2021. They optimized this B3 called bottom-up B3 deletion, where they detect during a read operation that, oh, some of those version churns can be marked as deleted during my read, so that vacuum doesn't have to kick in, consume CPU, 
consume memory to do this operation. Right? So instead, they found a way to minimize the version churn in an update-heavy workload where they effectively uh, will, will do this delete bottom-up deletion Right as as they find new old rows, they will mark it as deleted, and obviously the uh, subsequent processes will clean those up effectively. But the the trick is just to mark these old stale version as deleted, so that uh, first of all, old transactions can just don't worry about it. Right, we don't really need to worry about these things, and uh, our IOs will become efficient, will not straightforward because you need to start inserting some rows in this blank space that we just deleted, right? There is some work need to be done if you think about it, right? Uh, full vacuum will visually reshuffle, defragment, if you will, this empty space that is left as you start deleting those stuff. Guys, this is a, still an area that I'm, I'm researching, I'm learning more about, but it's just fascinating the different decisions that different database vendors make, right? Uh, Postgres with their uh, post-process vacuum to clean things, things up versus MySQL with their undo uh, files, but it's always, you know, older queries will be slower in case of MySQL, Postgres older queries will be faster quote unquote faster right yeah that's what i want to talk about guys today version churn in postgres and how postgres 14 handles it hope you enjoyed this episode and apologies for the audio quality i don't think it's that great but i'll be back soon and to the office and crank out some more content for you guys hope you enjoyed this episode i'm gonna see you on the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye